Today is Palm and Passion Sunday, which in many ways is a little bit of a compressed view of everything that we are going to go through in this week, this Holy Week. Holy Week for Christians, of course, is the Super Bowl, the Grey Cup, the Stanley Cup, everything all rolled into one. This is the center of our Christian life, and today we will begin with the procession of palms, a little bit different, of course, than we do most years because it's basically going to be me, but I encourage you to turn and face the processional cross at the back as we join together in remembering the triumphal entry of our Lord into Jerusalem at the beginning of what we call Holy Week. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, the son of David. Let us pray. Most merciful God, as the people of Jerusalem with palms in their hands gathered to greet your dearly beloved son when he came into his holy city, grant that we may ever hail him as our king. And when he comes again, may go forth to meet him with trusting and steadfast hearts and follow him in the way that leads to eternal life. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 12th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, You see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us go forth in peace in the name of the Lord.
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you sent your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, to take upon himself our flesh and to suffer death upon the cross. Mercifully grant that we may follow the example of his great humility and patience and be made partakers of his resurrection. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. A reading from the prophet Zechariah, the ninth chapter. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore to you double. This is the word of the Lord. Christ entered once for all into the holy places by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Our epistle reading is from Paul's letter to the church in Philippi, the second chapter. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. The Passion of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, according to St. Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council, and they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, and he answered him, you have said so. And the chief priests accused him of many things, and Pilate again asked him, But Jesus made no further answer, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the feast, he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them, saying, For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. 
But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, And they cried out again, Crucify him. Pilate said to them, But they shouted all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters. And they called together the whole battalion. They clothed him in a purple cloak, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him. And they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews! They were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him. When they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him, and they led him out to crucify him. They compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. I invite you, if able, to rise. There they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of the bystanders hearing it said, And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, He said, there were also women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James the younger, and of Joseph, and Salome. When he was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered to him, and there were also many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. And when evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised to hear that he should have already died, and summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. And Joseph bought a linen shroud, and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. This is the passion of our Lord. 
Beloved in the Lord, let us love one another, that united as one people in Christ Jesus, we might confess together our common Christian faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace be with you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Today marks the 18th time as an ordained pastor that I have led the Palm and Passion Sunday service at a church whether it was my first church in Philadelphia or in Houston or now here in Montreal. And so you would think that after having led this service for 18 years and having participated in it for several decades before that, I would know the story by heart. But I have to admit to you that this was the very first time looking at the passion according to the Gospel of Mark that I made an astonishing revelation that Pilate, according to Mark's gospel, only ever asks questions. The very same questions that each and every one of you read out this morning. Did you notice that? That each and every time Pilate opens his mouth, it's to try and figure something out. Pilate asks Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? Pilate asks him again, have you no answer to make? Pilate addresses the crowds. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? And again, then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And the final and most poignant and hard-hitting question, why? What evil has he done? Pilate, just asking questions. Because you see, according to Mark's narrative, Pilate is not a source of truth. He is at best a seeker after the truth, or maybe even at worst, an agnostic to the entire truth business altogether. After all, this is the man that, according to John's gospel, responds to Jesus after a period of questioning, what is truth? This is Holy Week. As I said, this is the centerpiece of our Christian life, the week that we set aside to follow in the footsteps of our Lord as he enters into the holy city, celebrates the Last Supper with his disciples, is betrayed into the hands of the council and the governor, and finally crucified. And of course, a week from today, we celebrate the fact that he rose from the dead. And that makes Holy Week a great time to ask and reflect on the really great questions that we have, the big questions that we're often so busy running around 
doing our errands and chores and work and looking after family and friends. We just don't have the time to sit back and ask, why am I here? What is life all about? What is the purpose of the world? Why are there a human race? And yes, what is truth? Every one of the world's religions and philosophies exists to try and answer those questions. Because those questions shape our actions and our words with each other. They shape our whole societies and they shape our future. From the simple, what should I have for lunch? To what should I say to my daughter? To who should I marry? To should I change jobs? To who should I vote for? To should I report that on my taxes? To should I volunteer to fight if our nation goes to war? Our worldview, what we think about all of those super big questions, shapes what we're going to do when we're confronted with the little ones. But for most people, And you probably know many of these people because we live in Montreal, a very secular 21st century city. The answer to the question, what is life really all about, is simply, huh, I don't know, whatever. And so, huh, I don't know, whatever, is what informs people's answers to all those other little questions I just asked. Now, under normal conditions, That's okay. Life goes on. We decide that we're going to have a hamburger for lunch instead of ordering a pizza. We decide that we're going to get married instead of not get married. We decide we're going to apply for a new job. Life goes on, even in a society where the majority of people are wandering around going, eh, life just is whatever. The problem is when stresses come. When things start to fall apart, individually to us and then collectively as a group of people. When that starts to happen in a society where the average person is walking around with, huh, as the answer to what is life all about, that's when everything really starts to come off the rails. And we start to see things not hold together. That's what happens when people don't take any time, A, to ask the right questions, and B, to think about what the answer might be. And so we go back to Pilate, poor old Pontius Pilate, who asks his first question, are you the king of the Jews? Because everyone else seems to think that you are, and they don't like it. It's bothering them, so much so that I'm being dragged out here to have this trial bright and early on a Friday morning. But all Jesus answers is, you have said so. Those are your words. It's what you have to say in answer to the question. And why does Jesus say that? Because it's the wrong question. It's not the right one. So what if Jesus is the king of the Jews? So what if Jesus says, Pilate, yes, absolutely, that's who I am. All that does is give Pilate Super easy way out. All right, he's a rebel, rebel against Rome. There only is one king, and he's the emperor. We know what to do with rebels. We crucify them, hands washed, move on with the day. Pilate also asks why Jesus won't defend himself. Won't you say something in defense of everything that's going on around you, This, this storm that you've created in Jerusalem? This uprising that you've created amongst the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the chief priests and the scribes, such that here, during the great high holy day of the Jewish year, they want to involve Rome in a trial? Why won't Jesus defend himself? It's what you and I would do. Our boss comes to us and says, what exactly did you think you were trying to do in this report? Our gut reaction is to defend it. I I worked super hard on that. I, uh, I was up all night. I put all sorts of effort into this. We defend ourselves, and yet Jesus won't do it. And again, the reason why is that it's the wrong question. 
After all, what is Jesus going to say to the Roman procurator that could possibly make a difference? Jesus knows the answer to that question is nothing, and so he keeps his mouth shut. So finally, Pilate gets to the right question. Why do you want to crucify him? <laughs> what, what has he done that would elevate him to the level of capital punishment? Now we're getting somewhere, right? Now we're really starting to get to the heart of the matter. What is going on in this man, Jesus of Nazareth? The problem is that Pilate's asking the wrong people. He's asking the crowds. He's asking people like you and me. Nice, ordinary, good people like you and me who lie. Who lie to others. Who even lie to ourselves about how good and ordinary and nice we are. The big question is this. If we are so good and ordinary and nice, dear brothers and sisters, we human beings who really just want things to turn out for the best, why was Jesus hanging on that cross? How did that happen? John chapter 10, Jesus is once again dealing with the anger of the religious authorities that over the course of the Gospels keeps mounting and mounting and mounting, as we'll see this week as we follow along and see the arc of this narrative that takes Jesus to a cross. And finally, Jesus turns to them and says, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? That's the heart of the matter, you see, and it's the answer to Pilate's question, why? What evil has he done? The evil that he's done is that he's made us all look bad. He's threatened our very easy and convenient life. He's accused us of being false shepherds and false sheep and misleading the people. He's healed the sick. He's cast out demons. He's raised the dead. He's preached good news to the poor, and he's forgiven sins. And for all of that, he has to die. To die so that we, you and I, who spend most of our life never asking the right questions, can finally get the right answer from God. And the right question is, what must we do to inherit eternal life? What can we do that death might be defeated once and for all? The answer is suffer cruel abandonment, be tortured, spit upon, belittled, mocked, nailed to crosses of wood at wrist and ankle, and left to die. Or the answer is put all your chips, all your trust, all your faith in the one to whom those things were done, that you might have his life in you. That's the big question. And the big answer, as any Sunday school student would know, is always Jesus. And not any Jesus, but the Jesus precisely who is crucified for us. This Holy Week, we will be following a very simple theme, Monday through Saturday, and ending on Sunday. Consider the evidence. We will, if you want, be backing Pontius Pilate up in time to a week earlier so that he can ask all those same questions but get the answers to them. We're going to see people trying to get rid of the evidence that God is at work in Jesus tomorrow. We're going to talk about how even when God does give us abundant evidence because of sin, it's mixed and we don't always see it. On Tuesday, on Wednesday, we're going to talk about the evidence of our discipleship. If we want to say we're followers of Jesus, what are the signs? On Thursday, we're going to look for evidence of Jesus' presence continuing among us. Where do we go to find Jesus in this world? 
On Friday, of course, the evidence of God's love for us, precisely in dying for us. On Saturday night, where is the evidence that there is hope in this world? And again, on Sunday, what is the evidence that we can walk out through life asking the big questions, knowing that God is able to give us the answers? We are going to do what Pilate didn't take the time to do. Ask the big questions and let Jesus answer them for us. So I hope you'll walk with us as we let Jesus give us the answers we need to help and guide us in the small questions that we face every day. But also to answer the big one, what must we do to inherit eternal life? To which the answer is, believe in the Son. Amen. We continue our worship this morning with the prayers of the church. I invite you to rise. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, for all gathered in faith, piety, and love who come to receive his gifts and praise his name, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. That the Lord would uphold this world in his order, for the church that she would be defended from all enemies, for our homes that the Lord would bless parents and children in service toward each other and faith until life's end. And for the government, that God would grant all authorities health and wisdom. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our catechumens, especially Larry, as he considers the Christian faith, that they may grow in repentance, faith, and holy living. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the sick and sorrowful, for those who mourn, and for all who stand in need of our prayers. We pray especially for Olive and Carrie as they continue their recovery at home, for Massey, and for all those, and for Parmjit, and for all those whom we lift up in our hearts before you now. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who commune at this table this day, that they would receive our Lord Jesus Christ's body and blood in repentance and faith for the forgiveness of sins and in the unity of a true confession. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we here remember the sufferings and death of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, for our salvation. Praising his victorious resurrection from the dead, we draw strength from his ascension before you, where he ever stands for us as our own high priest. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. For to you alone we give all glory, honor, and worship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who accomplished the salvation of mankind by the tree of the cross that where death arose, their life also might rise again, and that the serpent who overcame by the tree of the garden 
might likewise by the tree of the cross be overcome. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we evermore laud and magnify your glorious name. Lord Jesus, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us peace. Grant us peace. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Happy are they who are called to this supper. I believe our musicians are going to commune first. Oh. 
This true body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in body and soul unto life everlasting. Abide in the peace of Christ. Amen. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.